So now I have great pleasure in introducing our final speaker of this afternoon, our first session, and that is the wonderful Hannah Levy. There she is, Dr. Hannah Levy. She's a paediatric clinical psychologist um, based at the Royal Brompton Hospital, who specifically um, works with the ICC team, and she's going to give us a lovely talk on psychological aspects of ICC patient care. Over to you, Hannah. Can you hear me? I can and I can see right. you. You can see me. I'm going to share my screen and hope that technology doesn't fail me. Just give me one minute. All right. Hopefully this will work. Right, hold on. Something's happening. There we go. So can you see my slide? Yes, yes we can. OK, and you can hear me. Brilliant. So hi, I'm um, Hannah Levy. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist um, and I work within the paediatric clinical psychology service at the Royal Brompton Hospital. Um, I've been working within the inherited cardiac condition service now for around six years. Um, my post was originally funded by um, a charity called the Ben Williams Trust, and then it's since been funded by the Brompton and now by GSTT. Um, so I come to this presentation with a bit of a paediatric hat on, but as you can imagine, much of the information is really applicable to all age groups, including adults and parents um, who are impacted or may be impacted by the same condition as their children. I hope that I'm sorry, I'm going to rush through my slides. Um, it feels a bit like a whistle stop tour um, of um, the psychological aspects of ICC patient care, but bear with me. Um, right. Okay. So I hope that this presentation will give a bit of a flavour of the psychological impact and interactions um, to be mindful of when communicating with and caring for patients um, with or impacted by ICCs. Um, I've included a very brief exercise, um, which I hope that you will take part in on your own. You do not have to share any details, um, but just to consider the experience of a patient and the way this might um, this work might impact on us um, as clinicians as well. Um, so please have a piece of paper and a pen to hand um, and hopefully, um, yeah, you can sort of have a bit of a reflective space. Um, I'll talk a bit about our approach within clinical psychology um, and in particular about taking a holistic approach to physical health conditions. Um, I'll give some headlines about the additional complexities that we might see within this population. Um, I'll have a little whiz through the research that there is um, around the psychological impact of ICCs. Um, and lastly, um, I'm going to present some tips or suggestions uh, for communicating with families um, around um, this, this sort of area. So to start, hopefully everyone can see this. Um, Lizzie, age 16, has previously asymptomatic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, her father also has, has the same condition and there's a paternal family history. She's monitored regularly by the ICC service. At a routine appointment, Lizzie and her mother are told unexpectedly that the severity of the HCM has increased and Lizzie is at increased risk of sudden cardiac death. She has been told that the medication she is taking is insufficient and the medical team are recommending an ICD. So I just want you to spend a couple of minutes, um, if, if it doesn't feel too uncomfortable, just noting down some of the answers or, or reflections you have on some of these questions. So what might be the psychological impact of hearing this significant news? What thoughts might Lizzie have or her mum or, or her dad? What feelings, what emotions might this bring up? Um, how this might present itself in their behaviour? What might we see? or notice what factors do you think might make a difference to Lizzie and her mother and family adjusting to this news? So what factors um, in the patients themselves, but also in the way that's communicated or the professional interaction factors? And lastly, what does this family's circumstances bring up for you personally as a professional? 
and how might this impact on your response to the family? I'm going to give just a minute um, for people to sort of have a think or make a few notes about this and then I'll move on. You can carry on thinking about it and I'm just going to move on to the next slide. So the literature consistently reports that across physical health conditions, it's not the severity of the condition or the disease itself, but the perception of the condition that impacts on coping. Um, and we know that there's an interplay between physical health, physical factors and psychosocial factors, and this is both ways. So with physical factors impacting on the social, psychosocial functioning of an individual or family and also vice versa. Um, and therefore, it's really important that when we work with our ICC patients, we're taking into account the biopsychosocial and treatment factors um, when, when we're having conversations with and caring um, for children and adults within a health context. And often this will include getting to know the child or the patient outside their health condition. So something in psychology terms we might call problem free talk as part of any consultation. And I know that we're really time limited with our consultations, but sometimes I, you know, it's important to go beyond the medical diagnosis. And as clinical psychologists, we assess um, hypothesize and formulate and intervene at various levels of a child or adult's experience, including things like um, parenting and family factors, so um, parenting capacity and style, what are the quality of the relationships like in this family that we're working with, um, social factors, so um, a child or families um, or individuals, culture, religion and spiritual beliefs, their economic situation, their school, their college or work context, um, their extended family and support, um, psychological factors, including things like previous experiences of hospital and illness, emotional well-being, health beliefs and attitudes um, in children, sort of the developmental age or stage of a child is also important to consider. Um, biological factors, so the impact on, for example, the child's mobility or independence or their cognitive functioning sometimes, or the physical and mental health of other family members. Um, condition related factors, so prognosis um, or repeated um, or predicted course of the condition, the nature of the treatment, um, the an any anticipated um, procedures or surgeries um, and things like frequent hospitalisation um, and the wider system factors. So things like the relationship with the medical team, the experience of communication between and across professional networks, so in health, education or in social care. And in my experience, there are some additional complexities to consider when working with patients impacted by ICCs. Um, each patient's experience is different. Um, so, for example, the type of condition, whether it's a channelopathy or cardiomyopathy, for example, um, are they symptomatic or not? Do they have a known genetic mutation um, or a diagnosis or are they attending regular screening? Um, and that the individual and family experience is a dynamic one. Um, so there are changes to the individual and family's health status over time and across the lifespan uh, with things like screening, possible diagnoses, regular checkups, medication, lifestyle changes um, to prevent uh, cardiac event um, procedures, treatments, all of which have an impact on the individual's psychological well-being and family functioning. Um, and there are also additional complexities that some family members may have the condition whilst others do not. Um, so I've certainly heard families talking about different siblings so sort of saying um, one of them is the, the lucky one or the unlucky one. Um, there are various dynamics and stories and multiple layers of context and impact within the family system that are likely to be around. Um, there are also additional complexities and considerations when, as Ellie has um, talked about, when planning for a family 
Um, and certainly I've had conversations with parents um, where children have asked them, you know, will my child be like me and how they respond to that. Um, I've also had experiences of working with new um, new parents who have lived with their own condition for a number of years um, and then they have a child with the same condition um, and the experience of that child's diagnosis can bring up a lot of very difficult emotions including things like anxiety, guilt or even um, sometimes um, tra trauma or re-traumatisation if their own diagnosis was following a traumatic event. Um, additionally, for many of the families that we see in our service, their diagnosis was in the context of a significant bereavement or trauma, such as a cardiac event. Um, whether the individual has experienced directly of this or whether there's a family story of loss or trauma that then sometimes can be passed down through the family system as well. Um, and a theme across this population is that of living with or tolerating a certain level of uncertainty. Um, and risk, um, including the risk of sudden death. Um, and I think it's also worth acknowledging that this is also something that I think we as clinicians live with to some extent, that sort of level of risk and uncertainty, and that can have impacts on our own well-being as well as our interactions with our patients. Um, there's an interaction between the physical symptoms and the cardiac symptoms. So um, symptoms such as dizziness and palpitations, for example. Um, it can be really hard work for our patients to disentangle which symptoms might be related to their heart condition and which might be related to something like stress or anxiety. There are also potential neurodevelopmental impacts of certain conditions such as CPVT, which may impact on children or adults learning, memory and attention. Um, and I think also it's like lastly, it's it's helpful to con just con consider and hold in mind that there is an increasing awareness of conditions um, and much more widespread screening, which can mean that people are being asymptomatically screened, potentially sometimes without full knowledge of the impact of a positive diagnosis of, of their screening um, and families vary in the way that they respond um, to this. Um, there is some research in this field. I'll kind of whiz through it, um, but we, we um, are finding that 18% of patients aged between 16 and 25 years um, attending cardiac screening clinic um, scored in the significant range for depression and showed high rates of anxiety. Grief, fear and gratitude, as you can imagine, were key themes identified by children, adolescents and parents when psychologically adjusting to diagnosis. So there can be this real both and of um, kind of grief and loss of the kind of normal fear and, and worry about um, a person's well-being alongside gratitude and relief. Um, and that's something that can, we often do see with families that we work with. There's mixed evidence about quality of life, but there are some studies that suggest that children and parents' um, quality of life is significantly impacted by living with a condition. Um, but there's also some evidence that genetic testing and screening seem to be quite well tolerated by um, individuals. Um, studies seem to suggest that emotional distress and psychological adjustment in those at risk who undergo testing is similar to the general population. And it's just a, a few extra studies about the psychological impact of living with an ICD. Um, as you can see, 13 to 38% of ICD patients reported clinically diagnosable levels of anxiety, uh, with younger ICD patients displaying more anxiety, depression and sleep disorders. Um, again, that severity of disease is not strongly related to quality of life, but other issues like mental health much more so. Um, and that's similar in, in ICD pa paediatric patients, the quality of life is much more strongly related to anxiety and depression and family function than the severity of the disease. And there have been a few studies that have looked at um, the um, interventions to support um, around an ICD um, and that group and telephone counselling seem to lead to better psychological outcomes following an ICD implantation um, and the importance of having sufficient support when adjusting to a device.
So we know, I guess, in my final slides, just thinking about the manner in which significant news is communicated to a family can impact on the way in which a child and their family adjust or adapt um, to a condition and the well-being of the child. And that's true of adults, too. Um, so I've included some of the things that might be helpful to consider when communicating with families impacted by ICCs. These aren't necessarily specific to ICC conditions, um, but I guess helpful to hold in mind. Um, so I think firstly to acknowledge the potential impact of the experience on the patient and on you personally and the impact that that might have on your consultations. Um, consider the room set up. Um, is it a private space? Are you going to be interrupted? Um, lay the chairs out in a way that invites a more open conversation um, and an open stance. Um, some eye contact is really helpful, but not too much because that can feel a bit intense, I think, for some, some people. But it's important in your body language to convey that you're listening to the person. I often think, you know, even so, sort of silent symbols like having a box of tissues out in the room um, that the, a, a patient can take one from if they need to, um, I think indicates that it's okay to experience a range of emotions about the information that's being shared with them. Um, considering the age of the child and their stage of development, and I think included in that is asking families at the outset how they would like information to be communicated. Um, so, you know, do, do, who do they want to be present? Some parents, for example, will prefer to hear news um, before their children, it means that they can then support their children with hearing that news and older children, adolescents, many of them say that they actually want to hear that from professionals and not second hand through a parent. So it's always worth having those conversations with with families um, and not making assumptions. There's this um, well regarded idea of before you tell ask. Um, so before you share news with families to ask what they know already. Um, asking a child as well, giving them a voice. What does mum or dad, what have they told you about coming to the hospital today before you know, launching into a conversation or asking an, a, an adult patient, what is your understanding of why we're meeting or why you're being, you, you're, you're having this screening, for example. Um, allowing emotion and conveying empathy. And I think sometimes this is really hard, um, but I think um, al allowing our patients to convey how they're feeling and responding empathically um, using kind of things like simple reflections. Like I can see I can see this news is really difficult for you or, you know, this is really understandable that you're feeling this way. Um, and and I think that sometimes just doing that can convey a message that it's you, these responses are quite reasonable and that also it promotes communication and trust between clinician and and patient. And lastly, oh, hold on, lost my slide. Um, allowing for silence. Again, this can feel a bit awkward, um, but it does help people to feel able to process and express how they're feeling without being rushed in consultations. Um, again, not making assumptions. Everyone's experience is different. Um, so asking some of those open questions like, how are you feeling about the information I've shared with you? Or how is this impacting on you You and your family might give you more information about the impact of, of this and what steps might need to happen next. Um, remembering that 40 to 80 percent of medical information provided by healthcare practitioners is immediately forgotten. Um, so always summarising conversations in writing, asking patients to clarify their understanding, um, considering memory aids, so you know, patients encouraging patients to make notes in, in appointments. Sometimes they might even want to record the appointment, but that can be more or less helpful depending on the patient. And always ending with, you know, what questions do you have? Um, an opportunity for you know, questions and a really clear plan about next steps, including things like contact details for who to contact if they wish to discuss anything after the appointment. And very lastly, because I've run out of time, I just wanted to include these couple of references in case anyone wants to do any more reading in their own time about communicating with children and young people about their own health condition or, or a parent's. Um, they're from Oxford University. They were published in The Lancet in 2019. They're both really excellent. Um, so I really recommend having a look. And that's it from me. 
Thank you, Hannah. A really fantastic uh, talk. And um, inherited cardiac conditions is really um, benefiting from the support from our psychological services. Um, I just wanted to touch upon uh, the concept of grief, fear and gratitude being sort of key themes and emotions. But another one that I think does come up is guilt. Uh, guilt at uh, from parents that have passed on a variant to their children or indeed survivor guilt whereby uh, a child or a sibling may have passed away or is experiencing the illness very differently mm -hmm. to the person in question who's experiencing that guilt. Um, what sort of tools or strategies can you employ to help people uh, cope with all of these very strong and difficult emotions? Can you hear me again? So I think I think it's a really it's a really important question. Um, and I think some of that is normalizing and validating the experiences. Um, I think that often with um, things like guilt and shame as well, it can feel a bit isolating, like you're the only one who feels this way. Um, and I've certainly heard from many um, families that I work with is is the biggest thing that as clinicians we can do is to normalize and validate and say you know we hear this lots from other families it is very very understandable um, and i think that there are avenues of support for people if they do want to talk more um, certainly there's a pediatric psychology service at the brompton but there's also an adult service as well so if it's really impacting on people's lives um, to discuss what support they need and be open to having those kind of conversations with people. Thank you.